excited to be here. It's going to be a good day. I want to welcome those who are watching with us online, too, and just echo what Megan said. We're just so glad to have our online family joining in with us. And um, like Brent just said as well, hey, I want to encourage you to get here this Wednesday night for prayer night. This is going to be a game changer for you. Um, we got some echoey stuff going on. It's all good. We're going to push through that. Um, but this Wednesday night prayer night, I'm telling you, this will be a game changer for um, your daily prayer time. Like it has literally changed how I pray on a daily basis, being a part of these prayer nights. So I want to encourage you to be here 7 to 8 p.m. for our prayer night. Hey, I'm excited about today as we continue on in our series in Christ alone. And before I even kind of get into the Bible, um, maybe you kind of felt this same way when you were growing up, but I always hated when we had stuff to do on Saturday mornings. Anybody else? Like, we got the early, early, yep, we got some students in here, they agree. Um, like, I, I would always have like soccer games and stuff like that, but I was like, mom, dad, like, listen, Saturday mornings is for cartoons, and cartoons only. Like, well, you know what I mean? Like, we, we, that's how I grew up is Saturday morning cartoons. I don't even know that they do that anymore because you basically can just like Netflix or um, YouTube, whatever you wanna watch at any given time. But it, Saturday mornings were made for cartoons when I was growing up. And like, I, I enjoyed like Looney Tunes and stuff like that, but really I wanted those superhero cartoons. Like, I mean, I'm talking about like Spider-Man, Thundercats, come on, come on. I'm talking about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. What? On the count of three, what, who was your favorite Ninja Turtle? One, two, three, Michelangelo. Yeah, see, Michelangelo was the best. It was, it's probably why I enjoy pizza so much is because of his love for pizza. But I love these cartoons. Um, but really, hands down, my favorite Saturday morning cartoon was X-Men. Any X-Men friends in here? Like, yeah, hey, I can still like hear the music coming on and I would hear it halfway across the house and I would stop everything. It didn't matter. Like, I know I have chores to do. I will do it in 29 and a half minutes once this is over with. Like, I gotta watch X-Men. Um, and I love X-Men because I loved all their different superpowers that they had. Like, I mean, Spider-Man was great, but he could only do, like, one or two really things. And, like, but X-Men, they could do anything. And if they came up against a villain that they had to defeat and they didn't have the powers to defeat them, then they would just create the powers, right? Like, they would just write in a new character. It's like, oh, yeah, this person can do that. And they put them in. But by far, um, you know, like we had Wolverine, we had Cyclops, we had um, Jean Grey, Storm, the Beast, all of these characters. But by far, my favorite character was this guy named Gambit. Does anybody know who Gambit is in here? Okay, we got like three people that understand who Gambit is. Well, so Gambit, he had the power that he could, um, he could energize anything that he touched put um, energy in it, and when he threw it at something, it would ex explode. And his trademark was these throwing cards. So literally, I wanted to have those type of superpowers. So I'm literally, as like an eight-year-old, a nine-year-old, I'm sitting there like throwing cards and making like the couch explode. I'm making like the table explode, just dreaming that I had these superpowers, right? Like, and my parents are like, what are you doing? Like, why, why in the world are you wrecking our, our uh, playing cards? I think that's very natural when we grow up. Like, we probably all, especially us guys, like, we dreamed of having superpowers, right? Like, we all wanted to be something more than what we were currently. I think we all had that idea of, like, man, what would it be like to have those certain superpowers? So I just want to play a game. I need everybody to participate. And I want to see, like, what was your favorite superpower? Like, if you could have any superpower in the world, what would it be? Who in here, you would choose flying? Yeah, yeah. I mean, go from point A to point B without all the ridiculous traffic that we have. Like, man, I'm getting there, you know? 
All right, who in here that you would choose telekinesis? Like you can, you can, okay, we got a handful. That means like you can move stuff with your minds and things like that. We got a lot of kids in the back. They wish it. Um, you know, I always think like, hey, then I wouldn't have to get my kids to go get me a soda from the fridge and like I could just get it on my own. No. Um, who in here that you would choose invisibility? Okay, okay. This is all the people that like to slip in and out of church without saying anything to anybody, right? Like this is, we, we know, we get it, we understand. Um, who in here you would have super strength? Like that person, okay, we got a handful. You, you, you get double parked by that car and you can't get out? This is all right, I'm just gonna move their car over here. What about super speed? Anybody with super speed? We got a, a handful, like, you get your grocery shopping done in like two and a half minutes and it would be epic. You wouldn't have to spend that much time in the store. And I think what really it all boils down to is like we all have this desire to be a little bit more than what we are, right? Like we all, um, we grew up and we watched these things with these heroes and um, really, I mean, look at what Marvel Comics has done. They've, been, they've grossed $29 billion in ticket sales at the box office. And it all comes back to, we just desire to be more than what we really are. We desire these superpowers. We wanna be something greater. We wanna see evil defeated and justice happen in our world. Well, did you know that actually in Christ, you do have a superpower, but it's not what you think it is. We're in this series, In Christ Alone. We're looking at Romans chapter eight, and as I've kind of read and kind of meditated on this uh, chapter, as Pastor Matt has challenged us to read this, I kind of see this chapter broken down into three different sections. The first section is who we are in Christ. You know, Pastor Matty's taught us that we're, we have no condemnation, we're sealed by the Spirit. And then this past week, he taught us that we were adopted sons and daughters. But then we move into a section of what we receive because of who we are in Christ. And there's two main things in this chapter that we receive, one of which is the Holy Spirit. So we, we, we see who we are, what we receive, and then we go into what we can do about who we are and what we receive. And that kind of finishes out that chapter. Well, today, I wanna talk about that second thing that we receive. Because I know many of you, when I start talking about superpowers and like, we're Christians, we've been around the Bible for a while, we're thinking that the superpower is the Holy Spirit, but it's not what you think it is. Yes, we are given the Holy Spirit, but we're also given something else that we can use in our life to stand up against anything that comes our way. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Romans chapter eight. It's where we're gonna spend most of our time today. And as we're turning there, I wanna give you a little bit of context to the people that Paul is writing to in this letter. He's writing to the Christians that are in Rome, the capital city of the empire during that time. It was the big city, right? And he's writing to these Christians, but he's never actually met these Christians before. He's never come in contact with these Christians. He's just had some friends that have gone to Rome and that they have met these people and they came back and they shared stories of the faith that these people had in the capital city. So Paul is inspired by their faith, but not only does he hear stories of their faith, he also hears stories of their trials of their suffering that's going on. Because during this time, this book was written in 57 AD, and during that time, there was an emperor there named Nero. Now, Nero wasn't your run-of-the-mill emperor. He was brutal. He was evil. He was ruthless, especially towards Christians. One time, he set uh, two-thirds of Rome on fire so that he could redesign it how he thought it should be designed. He wanted to make new statues of himself. He wanted the hipster coffee shops. Like he wanted you know, to redo the city, so he sets it on fire, but then he blames the Christians for it. 
So what happens is an outbreak of rage goes against the Christians in that, in that area because they're thinking, you just set my home on fire. You set my business on fire. It was because Nero was blaming them. Nero would make a sport, make a spectacle out of torturing Christians as well. Not only would he put them in the Colosseum up against starved wild animals, but he would also light them on fire in his garden to light up his garden parties at night. The Christians were suffering during this time. And Paul, he's writing this letter because they need encouragement. But maybe that's where you are today. Like in, the, in today's political climate and what you're experiencing with your friends and family members, you're suffering as well. Maybe you're just trying to live a godly life, but your neighbors are calling you a bigot or a radical. Maybe you're just trying to love and raise your children in a right way, but you're seen as in opposition to the current climate because you're not gonna use the pronouns for your, your, your child's friend that the world tells you that you have to use. Maybe you're suffering because you had a friend or family member that passed away way too early and you just don't even understand why. Why is this happening? Why, God? And I want you to know that Paul actually wrote this for you too. He's offering you this encouragement. And this is what he says in verse 18. He says, yet, What we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. This isn't that we're gonna figure out who's in and who's out. That's not what Paul is talking about. Remember last week, we already figured out who's in and who's out, and that's the people that are sealed by the Spirit. If you have the spirit of God in you, then you are a child of God. What Paul is trying to remind us is that there will be a day when all the wrong things are set right. There will be a day when we stand before God and he makes all the wrongs, all the injustices right. But they're still suffering right now. I know you're thinking, Chris, I I thought when I started following Jesus, my life would get easier, things would get better, but the reality is is that there's still suffering right now. And Paul, he's trying to teach us, hey, I know that you're going through something right now, but I want you to look forward to the day when things will be set right. So what do we do with the suffering that we're experiencing right now? What do we do when we're going through something and we're crying out to God and it just doesn't seem to be getting any better? You know, the question that pastors get a lot of times is, if God's a good God, then why does he allow evil and suffering in the world? Why do people suffer? Like, why does that child pass away from cancer at 10 years old? Why does that person have to go through so much in their life? As as a pastor, that's the question that we get. And we don't always have the answer to that. I think if we had the answer to that, we would be God, but we're not God. I might not have the answer to it, but I believe that Paul has the solution to it. And I think if you're going through something today, if you would just lean in to what God wants to say through this passage, you're gonna be able to stand up in the suffering that you're experiencing. He continues on and he says, against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. Because of one decision the entire world has been subjected to this curse. See, when Adam and Eve, they were given the choice to trust and obey God or to seize the knowledge of good and evil for themselves, they went against God, they made that decision. 
And that brought a curse on our entire world. I was uh, looking at a meme recently, and it said, um, Adam and Eve didn't wear clothes before the fall, so because of sin, we have to do laundry. So if you want somebody to blame for your laundry, then you gotta blame Adam and Eve, right? But it's so easy to look to Adam and Eve and say, because of them, now we're subjected to this, but that's not what they're getting at. It's actually because of ourselves that we're subjected to this. In 1908, the British paper, The Times, posed this question to its audience. What is wrong with the world? A Christian philosopher and thinker wrote back into the the paper in response, and this is what he wrote. He said, dear sirs, I am, sincerely, G.K. Chesterton. If we wanna blame anybody for the way that the world is, it's on us. And you know, you know the thoughts that you have. You know the things that you have done. You know the wickedness that's inside yourself. And because of that, all of creation is subjected to this. Paul continues and he says, but with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. All of creation, we understand that things should not be this way. Like, it was never meant to be like this. But the fact of the matter is, is that it is this way. It says, for we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory, for we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. So we understand that things were not supposed to be this way. And he uses this metaphor of groaning to describe what creation is doing in this moment. When I think about groaning, I think about my dogs. One of my dogs, um, she's a puppy, she's just a year old, and um, she doesn't groan, but she, uh, she snores, like, loud. It's, it's ridiculous. Sometimes uh, we call her Serdita, and that's the Spanish word for piggy, um, because it sounds like she's oinking when she's snoring. It's like, oh, little Serdita. But my older dog, she's about nine years old, and she groans. And maybe it's just when she's getting up for the first time in the morning, or maybe she's just even laying there. Maybe it's because our little dog is being annoying to her. Um, but she groans, and, and that's kind of the picture that I get, that things shouldn't be this way. Like, she should be healthy and active and running around, but as she's growing in her old age, she's laying around more and she's groaning. And that's, that's the picture that Paul is giving us. It's like, things shouldn't be this way. We all understand how it should be, but they're not that way. So we have this dynamic of what's going on right now and what's going to happen in the future Right now we have death and decay, we have sin, we have suffering. We have this groaning because we long for it to be perfected. But then one day, Paul says, that we're gonna have freedom from death and decay. We're gonna have freedom from this sin and suffering. Things are gonna be set right. Things are gonna be made right. But the reality is, that it's not that way. And I know you're hearing this and you're like, well, that's great that one day things are gonna be okay, but Pastor Chris, I'm, I'm suffering right now. So what do I do with the suffering? And Paul just gives us a little glimpse. He gives us a little nugget in this next section. 
he offers us this encouragement as he carries on this passage. And he says, we were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it, but if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. He says, there's hope. Now there's a difference between worldly hope and biblical hope. The way that the world hopes is more like hopeful thinking. Like, man, I really hope I get a good grade on this test. I really hope that so-and-so gets elected. I really hope that I don't have to pay for parking when I show up. That's the way that the world hopes, and it's more like a birthday wish. You know, like you lit the candles on the birthday cake, and you, you just silently say your wish, like, I want a pony. You blow out the candles, and then nothing changes. That's not the type of hope that Paul is talking about. He's talking about a biblical type of hope that's not based on your circumstances. This is what biblical hope is, a confident expectation of good based on God's past faithfulness. So we know that he has done this before. We're confident that he will do it again And he will work all things for the good of those who love him. This is what type of hope Paul is talking about. And Paul uses hope like a superpower. It's amazing. You you read the stories of Paul and in, in the books that he wrote and even in Acts, he would go up against all sorts of things, but he would never lose his hope. And he would activate it in his life. So that he could face anything in this world and still have hope in the future. Maybe you're thinking, well, that might be Paul. Like, I mean, sure, Paul has that hope. He got to see Jesus face to face. I don't know that I have that hope. But what our passage actually says is that you were given that hope when you were saved. What you just need to learn to do is activate the hope. And it starts, unfortunately, with suffering. Earlier in this book, in Romans 5, Paul explains it like this. We can rejoice, too, when we run into problems and trials. He's talking about suffering right there. We can rejoice when we suffer, for we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment. So you actually have this hope. You were given this hope at the moment of salvation. You just need to learn how to activate the hope in your life. And that's what I wanna help you do today. By Paul's story, I wanna show you how you can activate hope in your own life. So we're gonna skip ahead. We're gonna look at 2 Corinthians for the rest of our time together. And in this book, he talks about how he displays hope in his life. In verse, uh, or in chapter four, starting in verse 17, he says, for our present troubles are small and won't last very long. And sometimes when you read this, you're reading, you're like, Paul, you don't understand what I got going on. Like my, my present troubles are not small and won't last very long. They are large and they're eternal. Like it just feels like for the past decade or two, I've been suffering with the loss of a family member. I've been suffering because I've tried to just be honest and be, uh, live with integrity at my job, but I'm never gonna get ahead until I skip out on my integrity. You don't understand my situation, Paul. And that's maybe because you don't understand what Paul has actually went through. Later on in the same book, he actually brags about all the trouble that he had experienced 
all the suffering. He actually makes a joke about it because he can't believe he has to brag about his suffering to this church. But he says in, verse, or in chapter 11, starting in verse 23, are they servants of Christ? Listen, I know I sound like a madman, but I've served them far more. I have worked harder, been put in prison more often, been whipped times without number, and faced death again and again. Paul's saying, hey, I know you've been through suffering. Listen, I get it, and I'm not trying to discredit it, but I want you to know I've been through far, far worse than you would probably ever experience. It says five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Back in that time, they believed that 40 lashes with a whip would kill a person. So they didn't want them to die, so they just backed it up one. And five times, to the point of death, Paul was whipped. He goes on and he says, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, and you can actually read that in the book of Acts, the people that were throwing stones, they did it until you were dead. So they believed that Paul was dead. And I believe he actually did die in that moment. But the believers, they came and they prayed over him. They resurrected him from the dead. He's been through some stuff. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and day adrift at sea. I've traveled on many long journeys. I've faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I've faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I've faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. The only place he didn't face danger was up in the sky, and that's because we haven't invented airplanes yet, right? And I've faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. I've worked hard uh, and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I have been hungry and thirsty and have often gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Then besides all this, I have the daily burden of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak without my feeling that weakness? Like when you're suffering, I'm suffering with you. Who is led astray and I don't burn with anger? Mad that the enemy is taking them away. Paul is saying, hey, I've been through some stuff. He had a rough life. It probably, in times, didn't feel small and momentary. It felt like his entire life. But he still, he had hope in his life. And that's how he could say, for our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Yet, they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now, rather we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. Paul had the superpower of hope in his life that no matter what was right in front of him, he could look past it and see the future of Christ. And I want you to activate this type of hope in your life. And you're thinking, well, well how do I do, like, what do I practically do to activate hope in my life? The thing you need to do is you need to fix your, your gaze on greater things. This is a one point sermon. If you get nothing else from this message, fix your gaze on greater things. Don't look at what's right in front of you. You understand when you go through suffering, you have a choice of where you put your eyes. You can focus on the suffering that's right in front of you and you're gonna feel miserable. Listen, I know it's hard. I get that. But you need to look beyond that and fix your gaze on Jesus. Look beyond what's right in front of you. Put your eyes on Jesus. Then you'll be able to go into any situation and say, hey, this is only small and momentary. This is nothing compared to looking towards Jesus. 
So Paul, he activated this superpower in his life. And he was able to go through all of that stuff and come out the other side and say, God is still good. He's still worthy of my entire life. You gotta fix your gaze on greater things. Fix it on Jesus. And you'll be able to endure anything that the world throws your way. It's coming. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. That's why we gotta fix our gaze now on Jesus. In 1933 to 1945, the world experienced one of the greatest atrocities to human beings in Nazi Germany. Millions of Jews were placed in concentration camps and million were executed just for simply being a Jew. There were many survivors that came from concentration camps after the, the war was over and one of the guys that came out was a guy named Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl was a psychologist and even within the concentration camp, he came out, he was, he was looking at people and trying to understand like how people were making it through while others were dying of disease and malnutrition. Like how are these, these people surviving but these people aren't making it? And as he came back into the free world, he met with many people that were part of these camps and he just continued to study, like, why did some make it, but some didn't make it? And he came to this conclusion right here. He who has a why to live can bear almost any how. What he was saying is, people that have hope can go through any type of suffering and come out on the other side. People that have hope in the future, that have their eyes fixed on greater things, can endure almost anything in this world. And the reason why this is so important, why this superpower means so much to you, is listen, I've been in this a long time. I've seen people walk with Jesus in one season and step away from him in the, in the next. And I'm telling you, you're not going to make it until you fix your eyes on Jesus. You're not going to make it through that time of suffering. You're going to walk back into the way that you used to live until you get your hope set on Jesus. You need this in your life. And you might be thinking, well, I'm, I'm not going through anything, like I'm good. I'm telling you, a season is coming. And I don't say that to scare you, it just, it's the reality of the world that we live in. But still, we go back to that that first thing that he said. He said, yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. See, why we can endure the suffering is because it doesn't compare. It's like comparing a, a, a Rolex to a Timex, right? Like, it just doesn't compare. No, it's not even like that. It's like comparing a Rolex to a sundial. It doesn't compare. When we get our eyes fixed on Jesus, the world can throw anything our way. And it doesn't compare. We can say, man, this is, this is a small thing. This is light and momentary. We're able to bear anything when we have our eyes fixed on Jesus. I wanna invite everybody just to stand up to your feet. In just a moment, we're gonna sing a song out together and maybe you wanna sing it with us, that's cool. Maybe you don't and that's perfectly fine too. 
I want you just to have a moment where you fix your eyes on Jesus. Above any situation, like let's lay all that stuff down. Listen, you're gonna walk back into it when you walk out of here. You can lay it down for just a few minutes. Let's just fix our eyes on Jesus. And I wanna talk to you in here if you've never made that decision to fix your eyes on Jesus. I'm sorry, but you don't actually have access to this hope that we're talking about because you first have to put your faith in Jesus. But as soon as that happens, he gives you this hope. It comes alongside of you. You have peace in your suffering, in the storms. No matter what you go through, you have this hope right alongside of you. If you're in here and you've never made that decision, I don't want you walking out of here. Like this is more important. I want you to have this hope. So I'm gonna ask everybody just to bow your heads, close your eyes. And I wanna talk to the person that you've never had a moment where you've placed your faith in Jesus. You understand that he gave himself up on the cross for your forgiveness so that you could have eternal life, so that you could have this hope that we're talking about, so that you could experience the joy even in the midst of suffering. Maybe you walked in here with just chaos going on in your life. He's offering you peace today, but it begins by placing your faith in him. And what I wanna do is I just wanna ask you, if you've never placed your faith in him, would you start that relationship today? If that's you, you wanna begin that relationship with Jesus. On the count of three, I just want you to slip your hand up in the air. And I don't want you to hesitate about this moment. This is about you connecting with God Almighty. So if that's you, on the count of three, you just slip your hand up in the air where you are. One, two, three. Just slip it up so I can see you. Slip it up, I see you. Slip it up. If your hand's raised right now, I just, I wanna lead you in a prayer. And there's nothing special about these words. We're in a holy moment where you get to just connect your heart with God Almighty. So just, you just pray this silently after me. And I believe that in this moment, you will be saved. You say, God, I know that I'm a sinner and I need a savior. I need your son, Jesus. I need the forgiveness of my sins. And I need the hope that comes from following you. So right now I place my faith in you and I'll follow after you the best way I know how for the rest of my life. If that's you, I just wanna congratulate you for taking that step into the presence of God. Your sins, past, future, and even present, they're all washed away because of what Jesus did on the cross. And now you have access to that hope. And I just wanna encourage you to fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on greater things. And for the rest of you in here, maybe somebody's been going through something. God, I just lift them up to you. Would you remind them of the hope that you have for them? Would you remind them that in the end, you restore all things, broken relationships, heartache, all of that is restored. God, we just... Thank you for your word. In this moment, would you just help us to fix our gaze on Jesus? Jesus, we love you. And it's in your name that we pray. And everybody said, amen.
Come on, let's sing out together. Thank you so much for joining us today. We pray that this ministry has been a blessing to you. And if it has, would you consider partnering with us financially? You can do that simply through giving through the Rescue House app or making a donation online at our website. And you too can be a part of helping others discover who God made them to be. And if today's message impacted you, would you share it with a friend or a family member? And lastly, if you're in the area, we would love to meet you in person. So join us next Sunday at our Moxville campus location. Now, go be who God made you to be.